Welcome, everybody. So I'm going to introduce our subject matter expert today. Yeah, so our today's subject matter expert is, our today's topic is um, written corrective feedback and second language learning. And our subject matter expert today with us is Muhammad Falhasri. So Muhammad Falhasri holds a master's degree in TESOL and is a teacher and teacher trainer. He is currently pursuing a PhD in Applied Linguistics at York University, where he works as a teaching and research assistant. He has published several articles and has presented at national and international ELT conferences. So without much ado, let us go to our introductory questions. So our first introductory question to Mr. Falhasari, or can I call Dr. Falhasari? <laughs> oh, I'm not a doctor yet, so you can't really call me that. <laughs> yeah. And if I were, I wouldn't really appreciate it to be called a doctor. So. <laughs> Muhammad is perfect. Yeah, Muhammad. So Muhammad, um, as we know that there are two schools of uh, w, um, WCT, like uh, <clears throat> Truscott and Ferries. So two scholars in the field in WCF, uh, that is written corrective feedback have raised contradicting points regarding the effectiveness of written corrective feedback. Who do you agree with? Um, Before you start, Mohammed, I'm so sorry. I'm just going to opt to read both of them out loud, just so anybody who has kind of yeah, just for um, accessibility reasons. So the first paragraph says, "True, Scott, 1996. Grammar correction has no place in writing courses and should be abandoned." The reasons are A, research evidence shows that grammar correction is ineffective. B, grammar correction has significant harmful effects. This is from page 328 to 329. Next, Ferris, 1999, states, based on limited, dated, incomplete, and inconclusive evidence, Truscott, 1996, argues for eliminating a pedagogical practice that is not only highly valued by students, but on which many thoughtful teachers spend a great deal of time and mental energy because they feel that helping students to improve the accuracy of their writing is vitally important from page nine. Now I'll hand it back to you, Mohammed. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, really delighted to have a chance to, to, to be here and to talk to you. Uh, so in 1996, everything started. Truscott wrote a paper in language learning journal, and it sparked all the controversies. Before this, um, most of the research on written corrective feedback was done on uh, people whose first language was English, mostly um, kids of immigrants in the United States who didn't who didn't really need much of corrective feedback, but uh, feedback on content. Anyways, Truscott published the work, and then um, Ferris replied back. Um, a lot of other research pursued. And what happened was all these studies were trying to see and to show that Truscott was wrong. Um, and then I think since then over a hundred uh, papers have been published in uh, prominent journals. And I just want to talk about the summary of what, what has um, been found so far. Um, the majority of the studies in the very first years of the aftermath of Truscott claim um, we're focusing on revision. That is, uh, they provided the students with a topic to write, and then uh, th they gave feedback to students, and then they took the paper away th with the feedback, and then they gave the original paper to the students. And then they were asked to see, uh, if students are able to correct after the feedback their own mistakes without the um, mistakes being pointed out to them now. These are called revision studies. Um, that is, the students are able to revise their own work after a week or so, um, two weeks, for example. And then uh, the majority of these studies found that the students are able to find a minimum of 50% of their own errors, um, at best 65%, for example. Um, and then 
a lot of other researchers claim that, yeah, so even if you remember the feedback that the teacher has given you, it doesn't mean that the next time that you're going to write a new essay, you're able to use that specific grammar correctly. And revision doesn't really show development. It only shows optic, it, that is, you understood the teacher's feedback. Um, and that is why a lot of other studies started incorporating um, different designs where they ask the students to write new papers to see if now they're making fewer mistakes. Overall, again, the finding was that yes, the students were making fewer mistakes, but, but the point was uh, they started, I mean, the skepticals started claiming that, oh yeah, so corrective feedback works, but only it works for treatable letters. Treatable letters are the ones that are more rule governed, like simple past tense, um, but not for the idiosyncratic errors. Uh, like prepositions, for instance, or um, lexical errors, that is um, collocation mistakes, for example. Um, so to a certain degree, they started believing that, yeah, it works for revision. Yeah, it works for um, certain types of errors, but not for all. And then there was this third group of people who start claiming things that, uh, claiming um, issues like, even though they learn, it only leads to a form of knowledge we, we refer to as declarative knowledge, that is the knowledge of rules, that is not automatic. Uh, for example, I might, I'm, I'm speaking English now, but not necessarily am I translating English rules, you know, I, I'm, I don't know how things are going on in my head, but I'm just speaking spontaneously and all the processors are done subconsciously, that is, I'm not really aware of them. This is called, this is referred to as procedural knowledge. So this, the, they start claiming that, yeah, it's, so they know the rule, but in practice, when it comes to speaking or writing, they keep making those mistakes. And this is where we are left off right now. That is, um, we need a lot more studies to see if the students are able to use the knowledge that they have acquired from the revision in new set of writing after a long time or for a long time. That is, that is why we need longitudinal studies. So the answer to this question for me is, yes, it, it works, but um, it has limited, uh, I mean, it comes with some sort of caveats. That is, you can't really make, uh, you can't really claim that it's going to work for all types of errors. Just gonna pause here. Great, thank you. Thanks so much, Mohammed. Um, so now um, we've heard from Mohammed, and we want to hear everyone else's opinion as well. So please, if you'd like to answer the question out loud, please raise your hand using the reactions button. We're more than happy to call on you to answer out loud. Or if you are a little bit camera shy or maybe you didn't, don't have your hair done, um, we're more than happy for you to put your responses in the chat and myself or Ume or Mohammed will read it out loud for you all. It's a great topic. All right, I see we have a hand up from Gabriel. Gabriel, please feel free to unmute and let us know what you think. Uh, well, I've um, had the opportunity to teach um, students uh, when I first started uh, from uh, kindergarten all the way up to the university level. And I found that um, there, yeah, there, there, there are some, um, there are some, there are a few students, there are a few students that seem to respond well to written corrective feedback. <laughs> they seem to be in the mi minority. Uh, so it, it, um, in, my, in my 16 years of teaching, um, yeah, I, 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 that's why I'm here actually, to learn from what others have experienced and what others have learned and to find out uh, if uh, maybe something in my approach, uh, there's something I can change in my approach or uh, my methodology that, could help to, uh, you know, to uh, improve my written corrective feedback or, or else maybe I should uh, not rely on it as much and rely on some other form of feedback instead. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Do I get uh, go ahead and answer or do I wait for others to... Please, we want to hear, because I want to know the answer to what Gabriel just asked too. <laughs> okay. So Gabriel, uh, thank you for, for your very interesting question that you just raised. Um, yes, um, there are a lot of contextual factors and individual factors 
We're going to talk about them very soon. That is the level of students' motivation, the reason why they're studying English, um, the context where they live even could, could play a very important role, right? Age matters as well. Um, for example, corrective feedback for kids uh, is, is not really effective. I try it on my uh, five-year-old and, and it fails miserably all the time. Um, he keeps using much uh, for, for all nouns, regardless of whether it's countable or uncount. So he says much a score, much, 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 any, everything. And I keep saying how many points and he's like, yeah, how much point. So age matters and motivation matters. And as you, but, but uh, you also read something interesting and that is you said, um, you give feedback, but you think that um, some students don't really benefit from that. Um, that is, I think, question six or seven, where we would talk about what it is we could do to make sure that students engage more deeply with corrective feedback. Because if um, there is something very um, straightforward about feedback, uh, one of the um, scholars, oh my God, I forget his name, but it's like, uh, if you don't do anything with the corrective feedback that you have received, there is no way you could benefit from that. That is you, you, the, you, the teacher. What we do as teachers is we give them feedback and then we have them the paper and we're like, okay, you're, you're on your own, right? There needs to be certain things, uh, certain activities or um, instructions. We will talk about them soon. I think it's question six or seven. That is how we can make sure that students um, engage with corrective feedback. And we will talk about individual factors that you just brought up. Awesome, thank you, Mohammed. And I think Giba raises a good, a good point too. Do you think, Mohammed, it depends on the student themselves? And I know you were going to talk about different factors, but that was a really interesting point that Gabriel raised, not just the age, but individual students. Some people really love it. And I want to read something that Marianne said in the chat. Marianne said, interesting topic we are talking about. I actually had a student say to me yesterday, teacher, no one has told me about my writing corrections. You are the first. And now I am learning before they just put a mark on my paper and I keep making mistakes. So really interesting. Yeah, Dana Ferris uh, echoes the same concern. That is, uh, Dana Fair is one of the biggest scholars in the field of written corrective feedback, believes that most of the time teachers give very general, vague uh, feedback to students that is, hey, you need to improve your grammar or you need to read it yourself, revise it, otherwise I'm not gonna read your paper. This is what the students uh, don't really benefit from because they don't know what the problem is, what kind of grammar mistakes you're talking about. Exactly. Thank you so much. Let's go on to Xavier now. Xavier, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask or, you know, give us your opinion on this. Well, I have a, a, a slightly different perspective because I've taught both French and English. And uh, when I do the written, yeah, when I when I do the when I've done the, the written corrections in French, it's um, I tend to be in both English and French. I tend to be very detailed in that I, I try to explain to the student, here is your mistake. OK, you have to be careful. Why, for example, sometimes I would say why this word is correct, but not in this context, because I try to give them a contextual, the, the, when I give them the feedback, it's formative and it's contextual because you say, because writing is a, a form of social communication. So I try to bring it down to the level and say, be careful with this expression because this expression is correct, but not in the situation, not in the writing that you're using. It has to be, you have to use this expression. And in French, which is much more, which I find a little bit more demanding, I find that uh, it's, it requires you to be more rigorous. So you have to have like, not only do you have to explain the grammar, but you have to warn them each time the students, you know, you have to do the accord, the passé, passé, et cetera. Be careful with that. Be careful with your homonyms because in French, there's a lot of homonyms and they, they, they tend to mix them up. So you have to keep hammering them on that and say, be careful because like, take a look at the context because what I try to do is give them contextual. And I'm wondering if that's, uh, if that of using the contextual slash uh, social communication, a communicative approach is helpful or not. And I'm, I did teenagers, so. so <laughs> yeah. um, if, 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 thank you very much, Javier. It's very interesting what you just um, mentioned here. I earlier said that there are certain type of errors that we call idiosyncratic error. That is, they don't really follow rules like simple past tense in English would do. Uh, for those, definitely the only way that you could help students understand is to provide some sort of context to indicate why this is correct and why this is not correct. For, for collocations, for example, in English, that's the only way you can explain it. Otherwise, students have no idea why they need to say um, the, the teacher gave us a test and not take us the test or something. Um, the other thing that you just mentioned was, um, oh, oh my God, it just it slipped my mind. Um, yeah, I forgot. Was it the social communicative approach? Was it that one? That yeah, yeah, that was the question I had. 
Yeah. So, so yeah, trying to bring in the context. Oh, no, I remember. Um, research has revealed that if, even if you provide direct plus metalinguistic feedback, that is, you tell them this is incorrect, this is the correct form, and this is why, research has revealed that um, about 40% of the errors still remain in some sort of um, ruse for students. That is, they still don't know why this is um, correct or not correct. Uh, we teachers wrongly assume that as long as we provide direct corrections, the students understand it. There is a you can, what you could try, Javier, and would be interesting. I I tried it once. And is uh, if if as soon as write their essays in Google Doc file and then you're giving them feedback, the very next session tell them to in brackets write why you have given them this, this feedback. That is, ask them to explain why um, this is incorrect. It would it would very surprise you because you would see that oh most of the students don't don't know why you have provided this and that would give you a sense of when for what kinds of errors do I need to provide that that contextual clues that you were just talking about. Thank you, Mohammed, so much. I want to bring up something that Mitra is saying in the chat. And Mitra says feedback should be constant, content specific and constructive. And maybe she's speaking a little bit to uh, the question that um, Xavier had earlier. So thank you for that, Mitra. Now we have a kind of different question in the chat. I think we have, this will be our last question before we move on, Ume and Mohammed. But this question comes from Joseph and Joseph asks, what's the opposite of written? What's the opposite of corrective? And what other options are out there? So I guess Joseph's asking, written corrective feedback, are there any other options? You know, is there any other way of doing this? It's a very interesting question. So written corrective feedback is usually um, put across from oral corrective feedback. That is um, the feedback that is provided to students when they're speaking. Um, however, written corrective feedback, uh, the feedback on writing could also be oral in a, in a conference, one-on-one -on -one conference. That is, you sit with a student and you explain why these are incorrect. Uh, this is more in line with socioculture theory. Um, but unfortunately, it's not really viable in a lot of contexts in Canada to sit with a student to explain one on one what's going on. And, um, and, and, and why written corrective feedback? Because feedback doesn't have to be corrective. Uh, that is, um, feedback could be, oh, this is a great piece of writing. This is feedback, but this is not corrective feedback. We're, we're focusing on corrective feedback in a sense that you are dealing with erroneous utterances. Thank you so much. All right, so we've gotten a, a really good basis of what's going on. So Ume, I think we can move on to the next question now. Yes. So our second question is, what are the different types of written corrective feedback teachers can provide on students' writing? What are the benefits and limitations of these different types of written corrective feedback from both students' and teachers' perspectives? Um, so Mitra just mentioned that feedback has to be um, constant and systematic, and she's absolutely right. And for, for that to happen, I think teachers need to have a um, comprehensive understanding of the options that they have. How can I provide corrective feedback? Uh, there are three main types of written corrective feedback, but then you could mix and match them as well. Feedback could be direct. That is, I indicate where the error is, I underline it, and then I write the correct form for you. It's as simple as that. Um, now, what could be the affordances and limitations of this? Um, one of the affordances is that it confirms or rejects students or learners hypothesis testing. What, what is hypothesis testing? We believe that um, when students write, especially uh, intermediate and, and upper intermediate students, when they learn a structure, they tend to use it because they, they like using it. It's something they've read, learned. And this is called hypothesis testing. Um, so you teach them present perfect. The very next session, uh, session, you see that a lot of students, I mean, their students writing is infused with pre present perfect because they're just trying to um, use it. Uh, this is called hypothesis testing, right? Um, the stu students use it, and then they're waiting for you to either confirm or reject this hypothesis to say that, oh, no, you're not using correctly or not. Direct method uh, is good because immediately 
you let me know, oh yeah, you did it correctly or not. Because in, in direct, if you provide indirect feedback, that is you only tell me, oh, this is not correct. Um, it's not immediate, right? Because you just underlined it and I don't know what the correct form is. You give me the feedback, but it's indirect. I have to figure out the problem. And then if I don't, I return it back to you. And then the very next session, you, you, you write the correct form. So it's not immediate. The only immediate form is direct feedback, right? Um, direct feedback can be claimed to be the only types of type of corrective feedback that, that could be effective for complex errors, for errors that we think are idiosyncratic as well. What Javier just talked about, that is when idioms, for example, that are, I mean, <laughs> indirect feedback is not gonna help, right? Um, so if it is, it is something that you think is way over their head, let's say past perfect um, tense, and in, in for intermediate students, most probably they're not gonna figure it out on their own, right? Uh, at least we're just assuming uh, there has to be research. But the corrective feedback that is direct um, is mostly um, effective for these types of errors that students do not have declarative knowledge, that is the knowledge of rules. Um, so this is the first kind. The, the problem with direct feedback, not a problem, but a limitation is that it requires minimal processing. That is, uh, students are given the answer, so they don't have to think about it. Um, this is why we always, um, teachers usually say, I keep telling students not to say she go, but she goes and everybody says she go. Maybe it is because they're not thinking about it. Maybe they're not reflecting upon it. They're like, oh, I know that. Uh, they take it for granted somehow. Um, so that is direct feedback. Feedback could be indirect. Indirect could be, could be implemented in a number of ways. One, you could simply underline the mistake, that's it. Uh, the other one is you read the, the, the line and in this line, there are two mistakes. You don't underline them, but at the end of the line, like you write number two to just indicate there are two errors in this sentence, just fix them up. Um, or you could do it both of them. That is you underline and then you write numbers as well. Indirect feedback theoretically seems to be the best. Theoretically, I need to emphasize that is, uh, the reason is that uh, it encourages self-discovery and problem solving through deep cognitive processing um, because the students have to reflect on your feedback. They have to reread the sentence a number of times to see what the problem is here. It's output inducing. Uh, that is, it pushes the students to, if they can, correct it to produce language, which is in line with output hypothesis. Um, it's learner-centered approach, right? The, the emphasis is put, uh, the, the, is put on the um, students rather than the teachers. So um, seems like a great way to give feedback to students, but it's got its own limitations as well, right? It's really frustrating. Sometimes it could be confusing. Um, students don't really appreciate it. They think that it's because you're just cutting slacks. So you don't really want to do your job. So it's underlying a couple of things and you're on your own to correct things. Um, they don't really appreciate it. And um, usually you get students saying things like, if I knew I would have used it uh, correctly in the first place, you underlining it is not gonna help me at all. Um, so yeah, these are some of the limitations of indirect corrective feedback. And then we have metalinguistic feedback. That is, uh, you explain why this is not correct. Uh, you provide a rule, you, you say things like, you're using yesterday, so you must use simple past and not present purpose. So you start, you engage in meta-language. Um, another type of metalinguistic feedback is, is referred to as hyperlink. I use that a lot um, just because I'm busy. So you see that the student has used past perfect incorrectly. And you know that if you want to write why this is incorrect, it's going to take you a while. So there are, there are different websites that I, that I know of, like, I don't know, grammar girl or something. And then they provide explanations for past perfect. So I copy the link and I put it in brackets next to the error. I'm like, check this out, watch this video. So they teach them past perfect. So explicitly, students love it um, at first, but after a while they see it out so for every um, two or three, they have to watch a video for two or three minutes. So as, as one of, um, I think, I don't know who, but somebody said it depends on the students. I think it was Gabriel. So if they're intrinsically motivated, they might watch the videos. If not, they're like, um, I'm not going to watch that. 
So metalinguistic feedback hyperlink is, is very interesting. Um, it, it doesn't have to be the rules. Sometimes you simply provide the, the um, adder category. That is, you just write verb tense or preposition adder to just indicate what kind of mistake it is. Uh, for this to happen, you need to have explained to your students. Uh, you need to have given them these codes. These codes are available online. You can find them. Um, what I mean by these codes is um, you, you have, for example, verb tense adders, preposition adders, so on and so forth. Um, the potential drawback of corrective uh, metalinguistic feedback is that both the students and teachers need to be familiar with um, these abstract words of past perfect continuous. Um, it, it all depends on, on students. Um, most of the Southern Asian students are very comfortable with these terms, right? Um, you get students from Europe and you say, oh, this is past perfect. and um, they're perplexed in what, 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 what is past perfect. So they're not really used to, so it all depends on the students you're working with. So there are three main types, direct and direct and metalinguistic, but you could do a, mi a mix of these as well. It could be direct plus metalinguistic. It could be indirect plus metalinguistic at our category. So these are the main different types of corrective, written corrective feedback. Could, uh, Sorry, I'm here. I was just writing it out so I could put it in the chat so we can remember. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Mohammed. Ume, can I ask you to stop sharing the screen at this time? Sure. Thank you very much. So I can see everyone's faces so I can remember who we're talking to. So that was a great question. So I've written in the chat, there are three types, as Mohammed has said, direct feedback, indirect feedback, and metalinguistic feedback. And we already have tons of questions and comments. So I'm going to choose one from Marianne that I found rather interesting. And she's kind of asking, you know, what do you think she's doing? So Marianne says, can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, I muted myself by accident. Marianne says, I teach higher level at this time. I have been introducing different symbols for correction. So for example, SP is for spelling, PUNC is for punctuation, et cetera. This way they take their draft in which they can think about their errors. And she said she's noticed that after three weeks, the errors are decreasing. Is this considered direct or indirect or in the middle? And I think you actually called this coded feedback, I think, Mohammed. Yeah, th they refer to this as metalinguistic feedback. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so um, Miriam wants to know, is this a combination? Is the way that she's doing it, what would you call it? Where would it fall under? So I guess, as you said, it'd just be metalinguistic. Meta yeah, or it could be indirect metalinguistic because she's not providing the correct form. She's just underlining it and, and she's providing the error, error type. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's awesome. Okay. Then we also have something else um, from Mitra. So Mitra was saying that um, she sees in her students' academic writing quality that there are gradual improvements, which is good. But the problem that she sees is that students need to be courageous, not just when it's a part of the assignment, but also when they're writing no matter what, no matter when. So not just for class or not just for her class or not just for her assignment, but also when they're writing an email to the professor, when they're writing for their other classes that are not um, an English language class in nature, but perhaps in their specific um, you know, degree or specific area. So that's one thing that Mitra has noticed, really relevant point. All right, and one more thing, um, Xavier says, that he finds that if you provide a mix of direct with indirect, students will start looking back at previous drafts or older work and notice patterns in their mistakes, and then they may start to pay more attention. That's um, a really interesting one. It is very interesting, and we're going to talk about that in a bit. That is <laughs> okay. how to find patterns and how to work on that. I just wanted to share, uh, if you don't mind. Yeah, some, please. So these are, uh, the error, as I said, the error types or the error categories that are used, um, it's not like, um, I, as I said, you can find a lot of different articles. This is a, an article that I published in the magazine, Contact Magazine, to and Terry, you can find it online. So this is like the most comprehensive one that has been published by um, Manchun. I, I just adapted that. So these are the categories that you could use. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You could simply give this to, the, to your students and say, whenever I put VT, it means it's a verb tense adder. Here's an example of what I mean by verb tense adder. This is VF, verb form adders. So these are uh, the grammar errors and these are the non-grammar errors, like wrong words. Simply say it all, as, as Javier said, 
you're not using this word correctly. It's grammatically, I'm not talking about grammar. It's just the, um, this word, the collocation is awkward, for instance. Um, so there are different like spelling as P, P punctuation. But the problem is that um, you have to train your students on how to use these. But the good thing about um, using the codes is that after a while, students know, uh, they, 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 they get to know what types of errors they're making more frequently because they see, oh, there's a lot of SP, SP. So I keep mis misspelling words, for instance. Thank you for that. And actually, we've sh I've just shared the link to that article uh, in the chat. It's a fantastic article. It's actually the reason why I invited Mohammed to come here, because it was really interesting. So please, if you have some time, do go and preview that article. It's fantastic. It has a lot of really great stuff in there that I think is relevant to a lot of us. Thank you so much. So at this time, if anyone would like to ask a question out loud, please feel free to raise your hand. There are tons of questions, or if you want to share an experience that you've had or your opinion on something, we're more than happy. Oh, perfect. Savior, please go ahead. Oh, Savior, sorry, you're actually uh, muted. Sorry, uh, sorry. Okay, uh, this is the question is from Mohammed. Now, in in your discussion, you were or in your presentation, you were mentioning about the meta meta linguistic or hyperlinking. Okay, um, for the students, especially the teenagers. Now, maybe I I'm getting this from my the when I experienced when I was teaching French. Uh, I don't think the meta, meta sorry the meta linguistic feedback is very helpful or useful for uh, teens. Uh, maybe the experience that I had, and because I was complaining this to other teachers, is that I find that the kids they don't read enough. Now, me it, it, and I, and the reason that that this meta uh, meta linguistic feedback doesn't is not as effective is because the kids don't read as much there. And when you try to explain the the the, the linguistic concepts or simple linguistic concepts. A, it's a little bit too technical. B, they don't get it because they're not reading enough. And C, they're bored. They, 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 they don't see the relevance in their life. And, I, and this is something that I've been struggling with is how to explain to them these type of the mistakes that they're making and to be aware of them in a, in a way that they, that's succinct, informative, and they get it so that they can pay it so that it helps them uh, realize what their mistakes are because this is one of the most frustrating things that I've had with them and it's because I find they just don't read enough and it's the same thing in English eh? I've noticed this phenomenon in both languages so what advice or what recommendations do you have on, on uh, uh, for this a metalinguistic feedback not being suitable for teenagers you're absolutely right uh, for for the three reasons you just mentioned and I just want to underscore what you said that is um, it's just too abstract for them. Concepts of verb and adjective or preposition of phrases and stuff. I can't even pronounce it and we're expecting them to get it. So you're absolutely right. They're just too abstract for students and, and they're not fun. Um, and then we get to the point that you said the students are not really motivated. And you said that um, they think that they don't take it seriously. That is, uh, who cares? They just have a couple of spelling mistakes. And, and this have if, if you're teaching at a university, this is the same thing. And what I personally do, and you guys, please, um, you could also share what you do. But what I do to just underscore to students how important it is to review and to revise before you submit by sharing some emails of my own students who had sent to me undergrad students. And I say things, guys, take a look at this email. This has been sent by one of my students before. It's rife with grammar mistakes and spelling and um, lowercase i instead of i means something. And I tell them, um, just imagine that I was in charge of, I don't know, giving scholarships to people or, or employing them. I wouldn't give these people a chance to, for an interview or even, I would never, if, if they had sent me their resume, I wouldn't even click on it to, to see how glamorous their resume is because I don't care at this stage. Um, there are the five grammar mistakes and, and, and seven spelling mistakes in this email. So I just try to indicate that in the, in the real world out there, you're expected not to be perfect, but to be uh, conscientious when it comes to what it is that you're doing. To, to put in the effort others otherwise in a country like Canada that I believe is everything in every field is fiercely competitive you don't really stand a chance uh, they don't they don't even uh, open up the, the CV so I think we need to just provide these examples like what would you do would you really uh, give this give this guy a, sh a shot like would you call this guy for an, for a job interview 
if you read this email, so this simply said that, um, oh, this, this, this is how we project ourselves. Thank you for that, Mohammed. I've also heard um, when it comes to teenagers that using a kind of incentive can work. So I've had a colleague who forced her students to hand in like a bouillon or um, like a rough copy. So they forced them and to hand in a, um, you know, edited copy so that they're demonstrating that there's improvement from the, from the rough copy to the finished or complete um, version. And they say that this can be helpful and there has to be at least some changes. I mean, this doesn't solve the issue of motivation. <laughs> it doesn't also solve the problem of, you know, you want them to start doing this on their own, but they, but they did notice that there were some improvements or that they start to notice, oh, I do have an issue, I guess, with different verb tenses although they may not have called them verb tenses, they start to acknowledge that it seems that I always have to go back and fix this part of my sentence. So I've heard of that working as well, although it doesn't, it doesn't um, provide a, a solution. It is an interesting kind of way to encourage some kind of help in that area, especially for that age group. Alrighty, are there any other questions or any other responses or experiences that we'd like to share? May I speak, please? Yes, please. Go ahead. I'm Susan. Um, just that what I find in my PBLA intermediate class, it's naturally remote right now. Uh, when it comes to writing corrections, I do what's very traditional in ESL or regular schools. I make a list of the really common, if not all, errors, and I make sure I make time in class to review them. So if someone constantly writes, um, he, go, he go to school, I ask the students, what sounds better in your writing? He goes to school or he go to school? And whatever they say, I ask them to explain why. Third person, singular, simple present. So it seems to reinforce when in a relaxed group, people are paying attention, they're listening, they have their pen and paper, and hopefully it'll have an impact on their future writing, the kind of oral review of common or very frequent errors. That's what I find. I wanted to say, Mohammed, that um, I think I'll send your list of uh, grammar corrections that you just showed us, Appendix A, for every writing task. Just so they remember, I have my own, but that's yours is more complete. And just there's no way they can say they didn't know. Basically, it's there. They can review it and hopefully internalize, have, you know, own it and have it handy for every task they do. Do you think, do you think that's a good idea? <laughs> Send it every time it is, it is a great it is a great idea. <laughs> if you do say so yourself <laughs> okay and, thanks yeah uh -huh. i just wanted to add um to, to what you just said and that is uh, so what you do is is to make sure that students engage with corrective feedback as i said uh, we'll discuss the techniques that we could use but this is one of the techniques that is you you make a big deal out of what it is that they have um like a third person s mostly we just underline it like oh yeah put an s they don't really think about it but you make a big deal out of it that is uh, you 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 bring it to, to the foreground for them to think about it and then um the other thing that you mentioned um corrective feedback doesn't have to be reactive reactive means we wait for the students to make the error and then we provide feedback on that it could be preemptive that is you know that the students of this level struggle with this a specific structure before students make any mistakes in their writing you write um, some examples that are incorrect and share them with the students you're like guys can you fix this problem this is student has been this sentence has been written by you uh, but you, then you just ask students to uh, correct it it's something that they can but you think like third person s and to just ask them to say guys this dr drives me nuts so whatever you do, don't make mistake with third person S. This is preemptive. That is before that you ask them to write anything, you just uh, make them alert regarding some the most common mistakes. Like don't make these mistakes, whatever you do. Don't, like somebody in the chat said comma splice. Comma splice, like big one drives everybody crazy. That's what you could do. Like write five examples like this, a big deal. This is preemptive. Yeah, that would be less singling them out. Singling out is embarrassing. Some have no um, 
consciousness, awareness of the grammar in their own language. Somehow they wind up with us having not really uh, mastered grammar, uh, linguist, that kind of uh, learning in their own language. So it's really starting from scratch. So it's nice to do it in a group and preemptive would probably avoid a lot of embarrassment, suffering, and reworking things. It somehow, I would think they hear it in the class and they might in, encode it in their brain better. Who knows what they do, especially in asynchronous homework and writing. We're not there. And we just don't know sometimes, you know, how it pounds out with them. So th those are good techniques. Thank you. Thanks so much. I just want to raise our last question from Joseph. Joseph says, any thoughts about integrating the use of Grammarly? Hmm. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. Okay, all right. So with that being said, I'll hand it back to you, Ume. All right. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Time. So our next question is, should teachers provide selective focusing on a few errors or comprehensive written corrective feedback targeting a wide range of or all errors? What should the decision be based on? Um, Yes, sorry. Yeah, I think we have talked uh, about it a little bit, but you can, of course, explain it more. Uh, so focus on focus feedback. Um, in 2019, uh, Dr. Lee published an article titled Less is More, and mm -hmm. she advocated for a focused written corrective feedback. And um, she argued that unfocused feedback is um, ineffective for a number of reasons. When I was reading her paper, um, I have a lot of respect for her, but when I was reading the paper, I was like, what? No, come on, don't say that. It got to a point that I said to my wife, I'm going to write a response for this because I can't sleep at night uh, to know that she's just advocating for focus feedback because uh, I, I don't really agree with focus feedback. And then I wrote a response that uh, will be published in Canadian Journal of Applied Linguistic next month. Um, I'm going to talk about what her arguments and my response, and then I would be interested to see if you think what I say is, is, is valid or you, you still think that Lee's arguments are, are valid too. Um, the first argument that she had was when um, comprehensive or, okay, let me just first say what I mean by focus and unfocused. Unfocused is that you correct everything you see, as much as you can see. Um, Focus is you're like, okay, I'm just gonna give feedback on tenses or maybe only articles, maybe comma splices. So you just target one, two, three. The number is not important, but you just select certain things to focus on. Um, so she said when comprehensive or unfocused feedback is given, some of the corrections will inevitably be beyond learners current stage of development. And according to processability theory, these corrections are not learnable, manageable, or helpful. This is what she said. And it sounds logical. Um, that is, certain corrections are beyond students' current level of understanding. And they, they use words like stage one, stage two, stage three. So if you're a student stage one and I give you corrective feedback that is in line with stage three, you don't understand it. I've wasted my time and I have demotivated you. Sounds logical. Um, I don't agree. Uh, for, for, for a lot of reasons, in, in, the, in the paper, I write three pages why I don't agree, but uh, just to, 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 to sum it up, if you remember, I talk about declarative knowledge, right? The knowledge of rules. Um, as Javier said, if we think of teenagers, yes, maybe they don't understand it, but for adult learners like us, we're able to understand rules um, and they're not really difficult for us. It's not really complicated for me to teach a group of adult learners that, hey, when you have prepositions, I mean, on, in, at, these are small ones. If you use a verb, use ing form all the time, like 
lo I'm looking forward to seeing you. Um, I'm thinking about changing. So after two, this is a rule, right? I just explained this rule. I believe no matter what level you are, you will understand this level as long as you're an adult learner. You're not a kid. Um, however, according to processability theory, you process the information, you understand it, but you only understand the rule. You can't use it correctly in your speaking. And I agree, because in speaking, you don't really have time to remember the rule. But I believe in writing, you can think about the rule because you have a lot of time. Even if you misuse it, if I if you read it over again and then you see I'm thinking about change, maybe you start thinking, oh, I use the word preposition. Maybe I need to use ing. You have time to think about it. So I'm thinking, yes, it sounds unlikely. In speaking, definitely, I agree with Dr. Lee that it's not going to work. But in writing, I believe that it works. The students can process information, but they would learn, they would develop explicit knowledge, not implicit knowledge, the knowledge of rules. I believe the knowledge of rules is still useful for students in writing. The second argument that she had was um, our information processing system is limited and therefore corrective feedback that is unfocused because it targets many different errors, it can lead to cognitive overload and in turn failure in noticing an uptake. Again, it sounds logical, right? Um, I, I don't, I don't agree, agree because again, I believe that in writing, we have a lot of time to process information. We're not really overwhelmed by the sheer amount of information because I have time to look at it, to, to, to think about it and have some tea and then go back and read and reread. Um, in speaking, I believe that yes, students can be overwhelmed, but not really, not in writing. Um, the other argument is that if you give them too many corrections, students become obsessed with grammar and it would be at the expense of other aspects of writing, like complexity. That is, because you give them a lot of corrections, they take fewer risks. Because they're like, you know what, maybe I need to use simple structures to make sure that I'm not making any mistakes. If you recall, I talk about hypothesis testing. You test the things that you have learned, right, to see if you can use them correctly. Some people argue that if you give too many corrections, then students would not take risks because they're like, oh my God, I see the, the whole paper is turned red because of all the corrections. Maybe I need to play it safe now. That's an argument. Truscott also brought this argument. Uh, research has revealed, several studies have revealed that this is not the case. A dear friend of mine, my, a dear friend of mine Sam is here. Um, he is doing a study on this. Um, I can predict that giving corrections does not really impact complexity on students' writing. That is, students are not going to take fewer risk. You can't speak for all the students, but uh, depending on motivation, but I believe that it, it, it won't. Um, she also argued that too much feedback is intimidating and demotivating and discouraging. Um, I'll talk about the emotional responses in a bit. Um, and then she said, it is important to be selective in terms of corrective feedback. My argument is, so what should I base my selection on? How do I know what to target? It would be haphazard. It would not be systematic. She says, you could target, for example, only tenses or um, prepositions, for instance. And my question is, how do I know if I'm teaching this class, I need to be focusing on preposition and not um, present perfect or I don't know, tenses, how would I know that other teachers are focusing on what? So it, I, I believe that that would also be unsystematic. That is, um, it would be subjective and any teacher would be focusing on certain things. Um, and I believe that we're, we would be depriving students of the opportunity of learning from the mistakes if you're just focusing on a few. And we give them the wrong impression of, hey, your writing is very accurate because you only have five mistakes. Um, but this is not true. We haven't corrected many of the other mistakes, right? So um, I would be very interested to see what it is that you guys also feel in terms of providing unfocused or focused corrective feedback and how it is that you approach the issue. 
Thank you for that, Mohammed. And can I add something? I'm also interested to know whether or not the institution that you work for dictates how you must or must not evaluate. Because I know that when I taught Link, I was told how to do it a certain way. I didn't have the option of selecting. It's very interesting. Dr. Lee, who conducted this study, was taught, also has written a paper about macro level decisions. That is how the, not only the institution, but the country that you're living in would impose upon you what types of correction you're supposed to be providing. She lives in Hong Kong and she talks about how in Hong Kong, you must provide unfocused feedback. Otherwise they'll kick you out of the school because school principals also believe that when, teach, when students hand, hand over their paper, it must be returned back, back to them, torn apart with a lot of corrective feedback. So yes, you're right, institutions, um, if even I'm saying the countries would impact. So these are the macro level. So with that, Ume, you can stop sharing your screen. Let's go over to the chat. And please, if you if you want to respond to this question, if you have a counter question, if you like it, if you don't like it, we want to hear what you have to say. Remember, you can use the reactions button. Um, if you click reactions and click raise hand, I'm more than happy to ask you to unmute yourself because we want to hear what you have to say. So far, I don't see any hands up yet, but it's, a, oh, I see one. Ume has her hand up. Yes, Ume, please go ahead. I'm thinking like, uh, don't we decide it uh, depending on the students who, like who are in front of me, like the level of the students, don't you think it plays a role deciding on, because, you know, at certain level, we focus on fluency. At certain level, we focus on, you know, correction. So what do you think? Um, Structural linguists believed that we need to break languages into pieces and start teaching each piece at a time. Um, after after um, task-based language teaching and, and Rod Ellis's idea of communicative language teaching, things change completely. So um, nowadays we don't really believe that we have to teach present simple first and then present continuous and present, per that, that's not what we do. Um, uh, so we believe in la teaching languages in, in the context. What Again, it all goes back to what Javier was talking about, that is meaning, that is context. So uh, yes, to a certain extent, for example, if you're dealing with elementary level students, um, maybe unfocused feedback would be overwhelming. But we're talking about uh, very beginners, like um, we call them false starters, the, the students who actually know nothing. Um, so for them, maybe you're right, but I believe that in context of Canada, you, you can barely find false starters, students who don't know uh, the, the verb, to, they can't conjugate the verb to be. I, I don't think you can find them here because they, they have definitely studied English to a certain level and then they have moved to Canada, right? I, I also talk about this, that is, yes, it depends on whether it's ESL context or EFL context as well. Thank you, Mohammed. Okay, and uh, Xavier, you had your hand up, but you put it down. Yeah, well, it's because I still wanted to, it's because I, I didn't, I, I wanted to put it down because I, I figured you would call me, so I didn't want to keep the hand up. No, <laughs> keep the hand up, go ahead. <laughs> okay, uh, Mohammed, um, I, I agree partly with Uma that it does depend on the student. What I've done, or at least what I've come to like, uh, I've done by uh, trial and error is a mix of both, focused and unfocused. It depends. What I what I do with the unfocused, I treat it as the macro thing. Okay, let's take a look at all the errors that everybody makes, and then go down, and then go down each, uh, go down to be more focus and focus on the certain errors that they need to be aware of. Uh, I find that with some of the students, it's really helpful because they see the macro and then they go down to the micro. Uh, with other students that are a bit more advanced, I don't need to be so unfocused. Just you know, give them a the, the, like a, a general a written passage or a text. I say, take a look at the the errors. You can see more or less where the errors and then where they where they have a lot of difficulty. We'll focus on that. If I find that a lot of students are making the same mistakes or similar mistakes, then we'll focus on just that error and just focus. And then sometimes it's like you start with the, 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 the micro and then you go backwards and you go up to the micro and see how it affects the whole structure. Now, I don't know if it's the, if it's a great move, but uh, I sometimes find that this uh, macro micro approach can be helpful depending on the, the student situation and, and where they are at and et cetera. Um, sounds like a great idea, but it doesn't mean that you're not using unfocused approach. You're still using unfocused approach, but then it's like a continuum. You move towards focused. So um, what I don't agree with is 
a pure unfocused feedback. That is, oh, okay. okay. Yeah, I get the essay and I say, I only give feedback on tenses. I believe that as students can learn from other types of correction that if, if you provide them, right? Yeah, I agree with you on that because I find that just just doing unfocused and correcting everything is unhelpful for the students because they need to have, again, not only the context, but they need to see the linkages between, you know, coherency, uh, uh, clarity, et cetera. Uh, so you have to go, uh, the way I always do it is like, a, it's a scale and it depends. Sometimes I'll be very focused because there are just certain mistakes, some some very specific mistakes they make, and we have to focus on that. And then you go backwards and then you work backwards up to show how this, er how this small error or this small problem affects the coherency of your text or the logic of your text. So I try to, I try not to do, pure unfocused and pure focus it's always a, a ladder it's like climbing up and down a ladder or, or doing a stairmaster you know? <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, so what happens with um pure focus feedback I, th I i think that it is very demotivating to students try it provide focus feedback to students and say that oh there are other errors here but um i just overlook them for now because i want she would is it because you don't have time um, can you please maybe correct those as well? So you see that the student is very interested to get an idea of all the editors they have. So, um, yeah. Thank but if you'd like to, you can read Dr. Lee's paper. It's, it's, you can easily find it. It's in the Journal of Language Teaching. Um, it's, it was published in 2019. My response is 2021, Canadian Journal of Applied Linguistics. Okay, so Joseph in the chat has a comment. Joseph says, I have an editing checklist of nine points that I use iteratively. So the students are familiar with those common errors and they differ, they differ thematically. So Joseph, would you say that then this is, <laughs> I don't know. You have to let us know, Joseph, what do you think that is from your point of view? And also Mohammed, what do you think that is? I, I don't know. Um, so if we can't really put numbers to what we mean by focus and unfocused, we can't really say that if you're targeting eight or nine categories of error types, then it's unfocused on, or focused. However, um, technically, if you're providing anything more than three to four categories, then it's unfocused because it would be a lot of errors that the students are getting. Okay, thank you for that. So I guess that's our response then. And I just wanted to say, like, personally, I've, I've had experiences with this. And I think from, you know, when you've been raised in a certain environment with a certain kind of theory that backs, you know, what you're doing, sometimes it can feel like, to me, it feels very wrong to do unfocused um, feedback. I know, and I, I hear you, and logically speaking, I totally understand what you're saying, Muhammad. but from everything that I've been taught and I've been drilled into me, it feels wrong. It feels overwhelming and it feels irresponsible. But when you look at it from the point of view that you mentioned, a student says, but I want to know all my errors so I can fix them. Because if I want to put in a resume and you say, well, I'm only going to correct all of your, your verbs. I'm not going to correct any of the spelling. And you hand that resume in is that a real world example of what would actually happen, right? So I, I think that what you're talking about, it, it may be uncomfortable for some of us, but it's really important to think about and consider. And, and, and I just want to emphasize that um, when, I, when I talk about corrective feedback I'm, as, as the title of the discussion today is, today is it's uh, on the, on the effect of written corrective feedback on L2 development. That is, we're not focusing on cohesion or coherence. At this point, we're talking about how, if you give feedback, students learn the grammar rule. So in that case, and, and, and students write about 100, 150 words. So I still think that unfocus is not really overwhelming for students. Ah, uh, that's a good point there. But, Especially but if it's a right. limited text. Yeah, but for EAP students at, at, at university level where they write 15 pages, unfocused feedback is not even viable for teachers. They don't really have time to do that. So we're mm -hmm. talking about, yeah, intermediate ESL student at a private school in, in Canada. That's that's the context. That's helpful. Okay, that, that makes a lot more sense to me. That yeah. makes me say, oh, okay, I, I yeah. get that. And, and in that context, I do agree that it's a good opportunity, especially if we have students that are writing independently about different topics. Sometimes it, it may call for the use of a certain verb tense or a certain um, different mm -hmm. kind of function that that's another student's not using and it would actually be maybe a, a bit negligent to not allow for a certain type of feedback that would be helpful for them and maybe not other students so I definitely see where you're coming from there thank you for that 
Okay, so one more comment. Xavier says, unfocused feedback can reinforce the focus because writing is a whole. If the small details are wrong or incorrect, these affect the whole written communication and vice versa. Meta error affect the small details. That's a really interesting point. Thank you so much. Okay, so Ume, it's 801. Can we go, um, there's a question that Muhammad had us to ask about um, characteristics. Can we go to that one? It's, it's um, the very next one. It's the next one? Okay, perfect. All right, let's go to that one then. So these are now discussion questions that we are going now. <clears throat> Focus questions are done. So what role can individual factors such as aptitude, anxiety, motivation, age, learning style, beliefs, proficiency level, etc., and contextual factors like EFL, ESL, EAP have on the effective no effectiveness of written corrective feedback? All right, so um, th this is uh, what we discussed at the beginning of the um, dialogue as well. That is, it all boils down to who it is that you're working with. There is a lot of different factors that are at, at, at play here. Um, aptitude. Definitely, there are certain students who infer the grammar rule more quickly than others. Uh, those will benefit from corrective feedback more than, than, than others. Working memory capacity, um, how much information I can handle in my short-term memory and then process, that differs. Um, this is my own area of interest. This is where I'm working on for my PhD. That is, we measure students' aptitude and working memory capacity. And then we see if this correlates with how they benefit from corrective feedback. Um, language anxiety. I mean, how nervous do you get um, because of being in this English classroom, right? If you if you get really anxious, you're less likely to benefit from corrective feedback. Um, motivation, that's the most important one. Is it, we have different types of motivation, right? One is instrumental motivation. That is, I have to pass this course to get a degree. Um, my dad wants me to learn English. English is the language of Canada. I don't like it, but I live in Canada, so I have to learn. These are instrumental. Intrinsic is, I like it. I just want to learn. This is the best type of motivation, right? It depends on which kind of motivation they have. Age is an important factor for language learning. Learning style. Uh, so we have um, ear learners and eye learners, right? I, I myself was, was, was an ear learner. Um, that is, I watched English movies and I learned English. Um, that's why my spelling sucks. Um, so I, I never write on a board because I miss a spell every single word. I didn't learn English by reading. I watched American movies for 10 hours a day. And th that my move to Canada and everybody was like, oh, you have North American accent. How long have you been here? And I was like, two weeks. And like, but what, two weeks ago? And I was like, yeah. And then, but how did you learn it? I don't know. I just watched a lot of English movies. So these, this is an ear learner. I was an ear learner, right? I learners are the ones that study grammar, they read grammar books and stuff. So who would benefit from corrective feedback more? Definitely the I learner as opposed to the ear learner. Because because the ear learner would be like, what, what do you mean by present perfect? Um, so their proficiency level is also very important. And um, Colleen just talked about beliefs, right? Do I see um, value in corrective feedback or not? Do I need it or not, right? I, I'm sure that you guys have, all of you have had a class where there were 10 students, you, you were just doing your best to motivate, them, motivate the students to say something, but they were just giving you this, they're just looking as, as if you were nothing. Like, and, and you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't even bother to give corrective feedback to these people because they're not gonna even write the essay for me. Um, and even if I try it, give corrective feedback, they don't even look at it. Some of them just put it in the bag. So you're like, oh my God, I spent like 25. Sometimes you explain to them that I spent 25 minutes. They don't really care. So maybe they believe it doesn't work or maybe they're just not motivated. Um, so it, it all boils down to a lot of different factors. It, all, it, all, it also depends on 
whether you're a native speaker, a non-native speaker of English as well. Uh, if you're a non-native speaker, you're more likely to provide feedback on grammar, oh, preposition to. If you're a non-native speaker, you're, you're focusing on awkwardness. Oh, don't use this. This is this is weird. Is lexical correction. That's what I mean. Collocations and idioms. And, but non-native speakers are obsessed with grammar. Not necessarily, but um, for the majority of teachers. So as you can see, there are a lot of factors that 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 play play a role. And this is where uh, most of the studies. Um, are focusing on these these years in the recent years. What is the Okay, well, thank you so much. That was a lot of information for us to take in. And now we'd love to open up the floor to everyone else. So please, if you'd like to respond, if you want to ask a counter question, if you want to answer this question, if you want to share your own experience, feel free to raise your hand and we'd love to hear what you have to say. Yes, I would love Oh, sorry, okay. Susan, I actually saw no, you first. Please no please problem, please. If whoever, <clears throat> whoever prefers. Um, I just wanted to say a great motivator for most ESL newcomers, because I'm sure, Mohammed, you're referring also to people, foreign, foreign students who stay here a while and study in private schools and go home. There's those kinds. And then there's the hundreds of thousands who come here to live. And a great motivator is the, just the listening and speaking requirements for Canadian citizenship. So those people I see there, when they're placed in my class, always the writing skill is the lowest. And so it's a very big challenge because they are motivated to listen and speak well and get their Canadian citizenship. I'd love, to, but I like to address everything. I wanted to just mention quickly another thing I do. Perhaps I'm spoon feeding, but when I send my Zoom invite and it's before a writing assessment, it could be writing for reading. This is how I call it, writing for um, a reading assessment, uh, writing for a listening assessment, or writing for a writing assessment. And in my, the way I've been trained is to focus mostly on the writing for writing um, and assess it that way, whereas be a little more lenient with writing, um, writing rules when correcting, uh, checking for reading and listening comprehension. So I don't know if you agree, but I'm a little, my group, my colleagues are a little more lenient with the writing for listening and the writing for reading comprehension. And I do in my Zoom invites remind people before a task, remember to use what we've learned this week. And there might be a list of collocations so no one can say that they forgot because ahead of time they do get a review from me from things we'd like to see them write and get used to in emails and also practice my email invites because there is a proper way to do an email. So every day they get something and if they read it out loud and copy it out, they probably will be more successful in a non-controlled uh, way at home, you know. So that's just what I wanted to add. Thanks for sharing that. You're welcome. Yeah, writing could have a lot of purposes. Just talk about two of them. Um, we have writing to learn and learning to write, and they're they're completely <laughs> different. Yeah. Writing to learn means you write in order to learn English. Um, mm -hmm. You use writing as a reinforcement of your lexical and grammatical knowledge. Writing to, sorry, learning to write is what we do at university. They teach us how to write paragraphs and they don't focus on grammar, right? So it could be different purposes that you use, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks so much, Susan. And now we'll You're welcome. here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, no, uh, when you were saying, Mohammed, that uh, you have different factors, I think that for written, uh, written uh, corrective format, I think that the age, I think age and motivation are the, probably the two most important things, followed by anxiety. And uh, again, I'm using the experience with my teens. <laughs> Because I find that the age is is um, the age is a big factor in written uh, communication. Because when I do the teens, like the when I'm talking teens, I'm talking like the middle teens, like uh, thirteen to fifteen. Basically, they they look at the review. It, it, if it's too long or it's too, they just a lot of them ignore it. They just don't they just don't appreciate it. And and sometimes it's a, I find it a bit frustrating. Uh, followed by the motivation, they're just not motivated. 
they they again they don't they they, they don't see what the purpose of the, the 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 feedback is because i guess because they're so used to having feedback like they view it as a negative thing rather than just looking at it as a constructive and i try to be very constructive i mean if i'm critical it's be aware you know you've made this mistake several times i've been going after you for two weeks please be careful <laughs> you know but i do try to be as constructive as possible and i just find that the old the, the adults and the younger children or the older adults like from 17 onwards, they do appreciate it. They, they, I mean, they appreciate it because they, 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 they appreciate the the time that I was taking and the fact that they, I'm giving them the the feedback to help them. So that's just the comment that I wanted to make. You can you can definitely conduct a study. That is, you, you could design some so some questionnaires and hand them out to students of different ages to find a factor of age and how they 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 value and see value in corrective feedback, right? Um, and about, uh, you just mentioned something about how they view corrective feedback. That is, it's very important to, to say to students that feedback uh, is not a sign of weakness, it's a def sorry, not feedback, errors. Errors, um, why do errors occur? It, it is because you're flexing those muscles, that is, you're developing your language skills, and that is why you're making mistakes. If you were just sticking to basic structures, you wouldn't be making all these mistakes. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Very interesting conversation so far. Um, I'm looking at the chat. I don't see any additional uh, comments about this. So I do want to move on just because we want to get to that breakout room question, Ume. So can you go to the breakout room question and then we'll put everyone together in groups? So you want me to go to the breakout room question? Yes, please. Yeah, so our breakout room question is, what can be done to improve students' self-editing skills so that they can become more self-reliant? Perfect, thank you so much, Ume. So everybody, here's your question. I can also, call that's okay, I can press play. <laughs> that's not that serious. I've done it a million times, it's okay. Um, but we're gonna put you into breakout rooms. You're gonna be in the room with about two or three other people. And we ask that you discuss this question. Don't worry, if you forget, I'm going to send it to you as well. So you'll all have it while you're in your breakout rooms. And you'll be in there for about eight minutes. Let me just check that up really quick quickly. There we go. So everyone, please enjoy your time. And when the breakout room option comes up, please accept Mohammed, Ume, and me. Don't okay, welcome back, everybody. I hope you had fun in your breakout rooms. Welcome back. Thank you so much, everyone who stayed. We really appreciate it. We hope you had fun in your breakout rooms. Usually at this point, we ask you to actually tell us what you talked about out loud. But because there's so much more information that Mohammed wants to share with us, I'm going to ask you instead to share what you talked about in your breakout rooms in the chat so we have time to listen to what Mohammed has to say, some more tips and tricks about written corrective feedback. So please, over to you, Mohammed. All right, so um, let's just talk about peer feedback a little bit. Um, peer feedback is criticized for the fact that it's blind leading the blind. Uh, it doesn't have to be like that. If, if you instruct the students and tell them what it is that you need to do, what I personally do is that I um, have a writing sample of a student. I, I make copies and give it, hand it over to students. Now, now it is so easy to just share my screen. Um, and then I, I ask the students to give feedback to this. That is, I start, I give them five, 10 minutes to read it. It's not really that long, it's just two paragraphs. And then they write their feedback down. And then I share the type of feedback that I would provide. And I instruct them, this is what I want you to do in terms of language. This is the kind of feedback that you provide. So I give them, feed and then I ask them to compare what they have done with the feedback that I have provided. And then I tell them, I want you to give me a number that is, uh, how many of the errors that you have corrected correspond to what I have and what it is that you have corrected, but it was correct in the first place. And I haven't done that. They find it very interesting. And some of them get really confident because they see that there is a very um, high correspondence between what they have done and what I have done. They're like, oh, I share 80% or 75%. And then I tell them, see guys, 
most of your classmates are able to give you really good corrective feedback. So take it seriously. It's almost 80% as good as what I would have done. Of course, I choose something that is, we, 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 you know, we, know, we all know what to do. So I just try to gain their um, trust and then uh, to give them confidence that they can do it. Um, it's good because when, when I give feedback to you, I learn better, obviously, because it reinforces my knowledge, right? Um, and it is easier for, it is, it's, it's research uh, that has found that it's easier for students to find mistakes in other people's work. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is uh, depth of processing of written corrective feedback. If you want feedback to be effective, you have to ask the students to do something with it. You handing them over or sending the, the, them back is not gonna work. One of the techniques is um, definitely uh, languaging. The highest depth of processing is done when students engage in hypothesis testing and rule formation and conscious activation of private uh, prior knowledge. That is, they start thinking why this is incorrect. Languaging is, as I told you, you ask a student in brackets to write what it is they're thinking. You ask them, explain to me why this is incorrect. You ask them to type. I tried it in for two terms in, in my classes. Students loved it. It was Perfect for me too. So, for example, you've you've underlined and said, "Don't say uh, move; it's moved here." And then they have to explain why this is incorrect. Uh, this, this they engage with corrective feedback. You're forcing them to do something with with it. Um, if you see that, oh, every single student is making mistake with comma splice, uh, don't correct it for all the students because you don't really have time for that. Instead, uh, say, okay, next session you start teaching it. That would be preemptive. Uh, teach the students that, that structure and then say, now I want you guys to go back to your own essays. I want you to find all the common splice problems that you have. Let me show me how many of them you were able to self-correct now that I've taught it. So for most common mistakes, teach them and have them revise. The other thing is a dicto gloss. I love that. A dicto gloss is, you know that the students have problem with a perfect modal form, like should have gone, I should have seen instead for example they say i i, I should say, saw or i should seen so you know that this is a common mistake right uh, create a story a very short story write a story yourself five six sentences that is seeded and infused with this structure for example say that uh, two years ago i bought a car which was a lemon i shouldn't have bought it i should have thought about it more and I should have talked to a lot of my friends. So I'm seeding this with, with this structure, right? And then read it to a student out loud twice, and then have them write the story down based on what they understood. This way you're forcing them to use this structure, right? And most probably they're not gonna use all those incidences correctly. And then when the, you can provide them with corrective feedback to show them how to use uh, should have PP correctly, should have gone, should have seen. Should have PP, it was funny in my head, but um, is that okay? Um, the other thing that I do, and I, and, and, and one minute, the other thing is it, it, uh, students love it is I ask the students to choose three or two sentences that are incorrect, that I have given them feedback and type it in a Word file and then send it to me. I use them to create a grammatically judgment test on Kahoot. So for example, on Kahoot, I would just make um, a test. Like uh, which one of the following sentences is correct? And th these sentences have been extracted from students' writing. And it saves me a lot of time because they've already typed everything. They've just sent their own editors. Um, they love it. They engage a lot because they have to explain why they're incorrect, which one is correct. And it's Kahoot, so it's fun. And last but not least, uh, for peer, peer feedback, when they do it by talking to each other, ask students to record themselves and send it to you. Um, this discussion of talking, students talking about the language, they engage with corrective feedback. And you also get an idea of uh, the kinds of struggles they're going through. So I, I need to stop here because time is up. Um, it was a privilege to have a chance to talk to you guys.